Your biggest risk today is a political risk, not a financial risk. So if you're in a financial position to do so, yeah, you should have a, a second citizenship and a second residence because anything can happen anywhere politically and it can be really inconvenient. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Doug Casey is our guest today, the founder of Casey Research. He's also a best-selling author, world-renowned speculator, and libertarian philosopher. Doug Casey has garnered a well-earned reputation for his erudite and often controversial insights into politics, economics, and investment markets. Doug literally wrote the book on profiting from periods of economic turmoil. His book, Crisis Investing, spent multiple weeks as the number one on the New York Times best-selling list and became the best-selling financial book of 1980 with over 400,000 copies sold. We're delighted to have Doug here as a return guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Doug Casey. Doug, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Well, it's nice to be here, although for me at the moment, uh, I'm just outside of Washington, D.C. I've been in Uruguay for most of the uh, lockdown that we've all experienced since March. Okay, Uruguay, how, are, how is the experience down there? Well, South America is locked down everywhere, but Uruguay is the mellowest country when it comes to that, with only three and a half million people and a large land area. And uh, it's, it's, it hasn't been bad in Uruguay, but I spend a lot, I used to spend a lot of time in Argentina and Argentina is under a draconian lockdown. So uh, this hysteria has spread all over the world. You know, Doug, when we last spoke with you last year, the world has definitely changed as you've given a couple examples to. You've warned for years of a period which you refer to as the Greater Depression. Uh, this might be a simple uh, question, but it may clear things up a lot for people. But what is a depression and how does it differ from a recession? And are we now in this Greater Depression? Well, that's a very good question that not enough people ask. I think the best broad general definition of a depression is it's a period of time when most people's standard of living drops significantly. So if you use that definition, you can have a depression for lots of causes, uh, fire, flood, hurricane, so forth, war. But uh, this depression is economic in cause as well as in effect. So there's a lot more to be said about that. But there are other definitions of a depression that work. It's a period of time when the business cycle climaxes and the business cycle is caused exclusively by the government's inflation of the currency. And uh, we're seeing that too, the money printing that's going on all over the world, not just in the US. And Europe is printing more money than the US is, but everywhere in the world is uh, going to have uh, really, really um, unpleasant economic effects in the years to come. So those are two good definitions to use. You know, prior to 2020, a lot of people were always talking about a black swan. Did you expect a pandemic could possibly be one of those black swans and, and could cause such a calamity that we see going on right now? Well, this whole subject of a pandemic, uh, I'm not going to say that what we're experiencing now is a hoax. It's not. Uh, it, it's true that there's a new virus out there, but there's a new virus every 10 years. You'll remember what was called the Asian flu, then the Hong Kong flu, then swine flu, then bird flu, and SARS. And all of these things were, were rather minor. What was important was the hysteria that resulted from them. And the hysteria as a result of, of this COVID thing is far greater than anything we've had in the past. In fact, it, it's one of the major hysterias in world history, maybe the biggest one. Uh, you go back to the famous, famous Spanish flu of 1918 and 1919, that was serious. When the world population was much smaller than it is now, it killed many millions of people. But 
the economic effects were relatively minimal, social effects minimal. In other words, it was just one of those things that blew through the, um, through the uh, population, came and went. This, this uh, COVID thing is totally trivial by comparison. What isn't trivial is the government's reaction to it and the hysteria that's been created among people where they actually think this is, this is of a scale of the uh, Black Plague of the, uh, of the 14th century. So yeah, it's a different world and um, it'll be a different world after, uh, after the current hysteria goes away just as it was a different world after uh, the uh, after the 911 bombings of um, of um, in New York the consequences of that have lingered for 20 years after it and the same will be the case here so not a good thing you mentioned different world can you share with us what kind of different world that that you see well there are going to be a lot more restrictions on what people do, and especially on where they go. I don't doubt that there is going to be a mandatory testing, despite the fact that uh, most of the tests for COVID are false positives, as Elon Musk himself pointed out, where he took four tests in one day from the same person, two are positive, two are negative. So what do you believe? He's not sick. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of that that's mandatory. You're probably going to have to carry a, a health card around with you. They're probably going to be pushing for a chip that will be embedded uh, so that uh, the health cards can't be faked. Because all over the world now, people are faking health cards that are needed to get into countries, uh, test scores for, for COVID. Um, it's going to have a permanent effect on the airline industry, uh, what's needed to fly, and on the tourism industry. And it's, you know, restaurants, for instance, go in and out of business all the time. It's the nature of the restaurant business. But you don't lose half of the restaurants in like a matter of months. That's unusual, and that's hard to recover from. So this is a, this is a real disaster. And the uh, COVID is also acting as the pin to break the bubble uh, that's leading to the Greater Depression. It's actually more of a sledgehammer that's breaking the bubble. So it's, um, it's a really serious thing. And I don't mean from a medical point of view. For that, from that point of view, it's only serious for people that are age 60 and above, or really fat, or in bad health. But flu is always a problem for those people, regardless. So as I said, this is usually overblown with the masks and the social distancing and all the rest of it. Okay, so that's a little bit of, of the future. Let's swing back around and uh, come back to where we are today with money printing. Decades of money printing. Are, are you expecting to see some type of major fallout or what type of major fallout do you think we're going to see from all this money printing and debt accumulation as we go deeper into this depression? Well, the U.S. has created trillions of new currency units since this thing has started. And uh, the Democrats, who apparently have won, uh, although it's not over till it's over, uh, are promising about 3.4 trillion more uh, currency units. Interesting. Trillions. People don't think about that. But let's say we have 300 million people in the U.S., and they're creating uh, three trillion more dollars. That's ten thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in the country. It's absolutely insane. Um, the consequences of it are going to be um, more bubbles being created. They've created a giant bubble in the stock market a hyper bubble in the real in, in the bond market, a bubble in many, many parts of the real estate market. The next bubble, in my opinion, is going to be a panic into gold and silver uh, as a result of all this money that's being created. And as I said, it's not just the US. The Europeans have been even more profligate than the Americans. 
Okay. So with, with all these things going on right now, um, booming assets, bonds, real estate, stocks, things like that, all these equities going up into this bubble. Why do you think, um, I mean, gold and silver has moved pretty well and, and now it, it seems to be going a bit sideways, but what do you think it's going to take for people to, to truly understand what gold and silver can do and, and how it can help them in this greater depression? Well, we're on the way to seeing gold reinstituted as currency, as day-to-day -day money, the way it used to be all over the world before 1933. Uh, they're going to go back to that because none of these governments trust each other's money. I mean, the Chinese and the Russians trade with each other, but how do they do it? They don't want to use each other's currencies. They use U.S. dollars, which is insane since the dollar is clear through New York. Using the paper currency, the fiat currency of your adversary makes no sense, and they're well aware of it. So. I suspect that uh, Chinese and the Russians both are going to come up with a gold-backed yuan, a gold-backed ruble. Uh, a lot of countries are going to start doing this. I mean, it was Mohammed Mahathir that a decade or so ago uh, advocated this simply because it was in compliance with Sharia law. I mean, Mohammed himself says in the Quran, you know, that the dirham and the... Um, you know, yeah, should be gold and silver. So, yeah, we're going to go back to that uh, around the world. Okay, and so that was a but, uh, but it can only be done at much higher prices because take the U.S. for instance. Well, there have been about six billion ounces of gold mined since the dawn of history that are above ground. Uh, the U.S. government says it has 265 million of those ounces. And if you were going to reback the dollar with gold, I mean, there are a lot of ways of crunching the numbers, but we're talking much, much higher numbers than today. 10,000 for openers. And this is true of every other country in the world. Uh, and uh, you'll recall that um, during the 19th century, the franc and the mark and the pound and the dollar were just names for specific amounts of gold minted in coins by the local governments. They were all interchangeable with each other. I think we're going to have to go back to something like that. And uh, it's not going to hurt silver at all. Okay, it's a great point. Uh, Doug, I understand that you have not sold an ounce of gold since you started buying gold back in the 70s. Given that the U.S. government for all intents and purposes, may be very well bankrupt. What are the chances of the government confiscating people's gold again? Uh, relatively low in the United States anyway. Uh, the reason for that is that, is that uh, when they confiscated it in 1933, was it 34, uh, 33, I guess, um, Everybody was using gold in day-to-day -day commerce. The double eagles, eagles, people had them in their pocket. They were used uh, daily. Um, and of course the um, US dollar was redeemable at the treasury for gold coins. So gold is uh, a rounding error now in terms of what the public owns of it. Uh, I don't think they'll do that. Plus a lot of the gold owned by the public is in the form of um, those old coins, which are considered collectibles. I think they'd consider it more trouble than it's worth. Uh, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my guess, but you can't tell what these politicians are going to do. I mean, a lot of them are actually criminally insane. Well, as proof of that, I offer the 20 people that ran to be ran for the Democratic presidential nomination. Doug, you're an international man, and your work has also highlighted the need to rethink jurisdictions that may help us prosper and even protect ourselves from bankrupt governments. Is internationalization, things such as second residency, offshore investments, uh, diversifying assets globally, are they available to everyone or only to those who are rich or have resources? 
Yeah, well, that's a good question. And as you're aware, I've, I've advocated people have a crib outside their home country for years. Because uh, if you look at what's happened all over the globe, Russia in 1917, Germany 1933, Vietnam in the 70s, China in the 40s, South America all the time, Africa, chaos. Your, your biggest risk today is a political risk, not a financial risk, even though the financial risks are huge today. So if you're in a financial position to do so, yeah, you should have a, a second citizenship and a second residence. Use it as a place to take a vacation in the meantime. It's just smart because anything can happen anywhere politically and it can be really inconvenient uh, if you're of the wrong class or you hold the wrong views or God knows what. Look what happened in Cambodia, for instance. So uh, yeah, no question about it. It's more important now than ever. And uh, I expect that we're going to be looking at something that resembles World War III, probably between the Americans and the Chinese. Um, it just seems like that's the way things are shaping up. I mean, war has not been banished from human history. You know, how, how soon do you, I mean, with all this money printing going on, and as you mentioned, uh, nations just don't trust each other's currency. How soon are we from a panic, let's say panic, out of the dollar? That could happen anytime, actually, because uh, there are, nobody knows, but there are 20, 30, 40 trillion dollars that are owned by foreigners uh, floating around the world. And foreigners don't have to own dollars. Americans do, because if you buy or sell something in the US, you have to use dollars. Foreigners can use anything they want, any other currency. So when things start looking really grim for the dollar, I think uh, non-Americans will uh, look to unload the dollar. But to whom? Where will they go? Well, they'll all come back to the U.S. and jam prices to the moon in the U.S. Uh, retail goods, but also maybe stocks and real estate because they'll all be, it, 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 it'll be chaos. So um, yeah, I, I think there will be a panic out of the dollar because it's, uh, it's becoming increasingly a hot potato there's so much debt in the world, of course, the dollar is needed for that debt. So you've got inflation and deflation that are tearing at each other, which will win in the long run inflation, I think. Yeah, okay, that's another great point. A uh, bit of a long question here, so, so bear with me. It, it is a fact that most people do not own gold and silver today, despite the record levels of debt and money printing. And their savings are in fiat currencies held in cash or deposited within banks. When confidence in the dollar evaporates and the panic in the dollar does happen, savings in fiat currencies will devalue to the extent where many people, sad to say, are going to get burnt. They're going to lose their entire savings, perhaps. And it's only then that perhaps the outrage and desperation will cause people to demand that gold return to the monetary system. Only then will politicians seeking the populist vote start to get behind gold and lobby for a gold-backed currency. Is this one of the scenarios you, you see playing out when that confidence is gone with the U.S. dollar? Yeah, it's possible just because it'll be... Not, look, governments never like gold in principle because the easiest way for a government to generate revenue isn't necessarily through taxes, although they love taxes, or by borrowing, because they're also indebted, it's harder and harder for them to borrow, but by printing money. And if you print money, you can't have a, a fixed ratio between your currency and gold. But uh, when things really get grim, uh, yeah, they'll have to go back to some kind of a stable currency just to conduct normal business. Look, it's impossible to do business in Zimbabwe using the Zimbabwe dollar. You can't do business in Venezuela using the Venezuelan currency. In Argentina, where I spend a lot of time, you can't use the peso for anything other than 
taxi rides and small meals and restaurants. So yeah, you need a stable currency if you're gonna have a prosperous economy. Yeah, they will go back to it eventually. When's eventually? Uh, maybe in the 2030s, I think that's likely because the 2020s are gonna be a chaotic decade, I'm afraid. Okay, chaotic decade. All right. Uh, perhaps maybe the lesson, <clears throat> excuse me, the lesson that all of us should have learned from this is to never let anyone have the power to print money unreservedly ever again. Could that have helped what's going on? Yeah, well, you've heard that the only lesson we learn from history is that we don't learn any lessons from history. So uh, the currency system is going to change again, though. They're going to use a digital currency. I mean, the Chinese are moving towards that right now. Uh, so are the Swedes, for that matter. So that uh, it won't be about paper fiat currency. It'll be about digital fiat currency, which is even more dangerous. Because if it's on your computer, I mean, the government can confiscate your wealth. They can do anything just by pushing some computer buttons. It's easier than ever for them to destroy the currency. So... Uh, That'll happen soon, and it'll be disastrous. Uh, I am, incidentally, a fan of Bitcoin, which is very different from the digital currencies that these governments are going to all come up with. Yeah, that, that's been in the news for, for quite a bit now, how these um, <clears throat> central banks are going to be creating a central bank digital currency. Uh, how do you think it's going to look, and do you think eventually it is meant to phase out cash and coin? Well, coins... I think they haven't said this, but it's obvious coins are being phased out in the US. Look, uh, other than for superstitious reasons that, you know, if you don't pick up a piece of money laying on the uh, sidewalk, it's kind of bad luck showing disrespect for, for money, uh, which <laughs> leads to disaster. But uh, there's a so called shortage of change of coins in the US. Nobody uses them, uses them anymore. Quite frankly, they're worthless. You can't even buy a video game with a quarter anymore. So for, I mean, they're worthless. Forget about it. So um, yeah, coins are, 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 are going to go on to the scrap heap of history because they're just made out of pot metal. They look like silver, of course, but they're not, they're just pot metal. It's, it's just another fraud that people go along with. Lack of, lack of education, lack of critical thinking. It's uh, something that tends to give you a, a gloomy outlook on the future when you think that the average man uh, feels instead of thinks, actually. Yeah, see a penny, pick it up, then all day you'll have good luck. Um, would, <laughs> you, <laughs> would you say that um, big government is perhaps the biggest or the main reason why we're in this greater depression. Yeah, it's actually the only reason because the average person, I mean, listen, we're all wired kind of like squirrels. We understand intuitively from hundreds of thousands of years of genetic history that we have to produce more than we consume and save the difference. And if you don't have savings, you know, if something bad happens, you'll starve to death or, you know, you're, you're out of luck. So. So people basically understand that. Uh, trouble is government comes along and it, it makes people believe that there are cornucopia where we can all live at the expense of everybody else, which is ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, government is the problem and government is the problem because it is pure organized coercion. You know, it's funny how everybody gets all, all uh, worked up about elections and things like that. You're just voting for Tweedledee, Tweedledee or Tweedledum, uh, a greater or lesser criminal. And most of the time, I don't think any, anybody with any sense isn't voting for anybody. They're voting against the other fool. So uh, I hope government's on its way out as technology keeps improving and as the world tends to get wealthier, because the world is getting wealthier despite the destruction that governments cause. So I, I hope the idea of the state is uh, flushed down the toilet and winds up on the uh, scrap heap of history. I, I believe that the market can provide anything that government pretends to provide. And it's only the worst kind of people that go into government because they're the kind of people that like to boss other people around. 
So, yeah, government's the problem. Okay. Assassin, uh, one of your, your newer books, is the motivation for your book, Assassin, a response to how people can dismantle the big government juggernaut if it cannot be achieved through the judicial or the electoral process? Well, I appreciate your mentioning that book, or I should say this book, because it's on Amazon now. It's been out for a bit over a month at this point. Uh, and I've got to tell you that Assassin, this is, uh, this is actually a great read. And it centers on our hero, Charles Knight, who we met in uh, the first novel in the series, Speculator, where he's involved in a bush war and a gold mining fraud in Africa. Drug Lord, where he becomes a drug lord. And uh, because of that, uh, at the beginning of Assassin, we talk about his serving a couple of years of hard time in federal prisons and what he decides to do about it. And the, and the opening line of this book is some people just need killing. And uh, this is the kind of hot potato subject that everybody thinks about whenever you watch a TV show, almost all of them, all these police shows, and there's always somebody getting killed. And people never think about the consequences of killing somebody else. It's just bang, something happens, TV show goes on. But this book is a, uh, it's a morality play talking about, is it good or evil to kill people? Which people? Politicians? Political assassinations, are they right or wrong? Are they, do they really change things or don't they? So it's a, and Charles works out a lot of very interesting technologies here that I think could actually change the world. It's not just shooting somebody, but it's a morality play where Charles, who's always a good guy, righteous and moral. So buy this book, it's on Amazon. I think you're, you're gonna be absolutely enthralled by it, if I do say so myself. But it's got a lot of answers to uh, the world today. And it talks a lot about uh, the nature of the money system as being one of the big problems that needs solving, which Charles tries to solve, incidentally, in very interesting ways. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. No, sure. Um, thanks for writing the have a hand in that that book. I'm, I think I may go ahead and pick one up after this this interview. It sounds oh, interesting. You'll be, doing, you'll be doing yourself a favor, I promise you. I mean, there are people that have said us, a number of people, some I don't even know, said it's the best novel I've ever read. I kid you not. Doug, should we go back to a gold standard? Can we expect the super cycle to repeat where we'll have a period of prosperity again? under sound money, but after some time, the dangers of money printing will be forgotten again and people will clamor once again for the ability to print money. Yeah, of course they will. But the answer to the question actually is no, we don't want to go back to a gold standard. We want to go back to gold as money. Uh, here's something that's going to shock most people. Why is the government in the money business? I mean, it makes no more sense for the government to control money than it makes for the government to, to make cars or the government to manufacture drugs or the government, for the government to do anything. I mean, the government uh, doesn't, doesn't produce anything. I mean, it's, it's, so the government shouldn't be in the money business because when they are, they always wind up destroying the money because they use it as a source of tax revenue. That's basically the thing. So, you know, money, it should be a, a market. It, it's always been a market phenomenon. And it's only when the government gets involved in it, starting with, well, before the days of the Roman Empire. It's one of the reasons why the Roman Empire collapsed uh, was uh, their money was no good. So no, the government shouldn't be in, a, in the money business at all. Yeah, I hear you. Doug Casey, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about International Man and what, what are you up to? Well, uh, internationalman.com is my daily blog. And not just me, but a number of other people who are, I, I've got a lot of respect for write for it. So it's free. Sign up for it, internationalman.com. You'll be glad you did. Um, I also very recently have started a um, 
a video blog called Doug Casey's Take, which is on YouTube. So go to YouTube and uh, see how you like that. And um, other than that, uh, I might write another economic book, but I'm mainly involved in writing these novels. And don't fall behind in this series of novels because the next one is going to be, they're, they're becoming, you know, both better and uh, more radical uh, as the series goes on. So I guess that's what I'm doing these days. Can't wait to get back to Uruguay and Argentina, actually. Okay, so uh, we'll be looking forward to that uh, follow-up to Assassin then, correct? Yeah, it'll, it'll be a year, so I won't mention anything about it now. <laughs> okay. Doug Casey, we, we thank you for joining us, and we, we thank you for your time, and we wish you all the best. Likewise, same to you. That was Doug Casey, founder of Casey Research, sharing with us his invaluable insights on the economic road ahead. To find out more about Casey Research, please visit their website, caseyresearch.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And to also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify. 